normally when someone finds themselves in one of these, they tend to stay put. But not so with old Edgar Allan Poe. A quarter of a century after he died, he returned from the grave to give everyone one last good scare. Find out how on tonight's Curator's Crypt. Good evening and welcome to the Poe Museum in Richmond, Virginia. I'm Chris Sittner, the curator here, and I'd like to tell you about one of my favorite artifacts. This little piece of wood, no wider than your hand. It might not look like much, but it has a story behind it that I'd like to tell you right now. Let's begin in Baltimore. 1849. Edgar Allan Poe died after four days in the hospital, delirious, in and out of consciousness, talking to shadows in the wall. His attending physician asked him if, the, if there's anyone who could cheer him up. And he said, my f best friend would be whoever would take a pistol and blow out these wretched brains. Then Poe screamed the name Reynolds over and over again on his last night. The following morning, he whispered, Lord, help my poor soul, and died at the age of 40. His body was handed over to his uncle, Henry Herring. And Herring and Poe's cousin, Nelson Poe, put together his funeral. Herring bought a neat mahogany coffin for him. And Nelson paid for the hearse to carry him to the cemetery. The ceremony was small. One observer said it was the most unchristian-like thing he'd ever seen. It was a cold, drizzly day. Only seven people were in attendance. The minister, another of Poe's cousins, said a few words, and they buried Poe in an unmarked grave. And that's where he stayed for 26 years. But Poe wasn't forgotten. His works surged in popularity after his death and continue to be read today. And Poe's admirers continued to come to the cemetery and ask the sexton to show them where Poe's remains now lay. And again and again the sexton was taking people to that spot so eventually he put a stone right there so he'd always remember where it was. After about 10 years, Poe's cousin Nelson decided that Edgar deserved a monument. So he had one constructed, had it carved, and just before it was going to go to Poe's grave, a train jumped the tracks and smashed into the shop, destroying the monument. So we move forward another few years to 1865 and a group of Baltimore educators gathered with the idea that they loved reading Poe's works. Their students loved reading Poe's works. He was one of America's greatest writers. So he finally deserves a monument. If Poe's family's not going to get him a monument, then the public will come together and do it for them. So it took nearly a decade to raise the funds when they were finally all together, a huge monument was commissioned with Poe's face carved into the front. The monument was actually too big for the spot where Poe was, and it actually deserved to be in a better spot near the front where people could see it as they approached the cemetery. So they decided to have Poe's remains moved. And that's where it gets tricky. The following day, 
three Baltimore newspapers, the Sun, the American, and the Evening News, all carried stories about the moving of Poe's coffin. My favorite account is the one from the Evening News. He set about his task early in the afternoon, and the sun was just setting behind the western horizon when his spade sounded on the coffin lid of the poet. It lay about five feet from the surface, and at first sight appeared as sound as when first put into the earth. On carefully raising it to the brink of the grave, Mr. Tudor discovered that it had partially broken in at the sides, and that the lid near the head was so much decayed that it fell to pieces on the ground. On looking through the aperture thus created, Mr. Spence, Tudor, their assistants, and the newsman beheld the skeleton of Poe. The flesh and funeral robes, of course, had crumbled into dust, and there was nothing left but the bare bones and a few clumps of hair attached to the skull to tell that a body had once been there. The skeleton was in perfect condition, the arms lying as they arranged in death, and the back and leg bones were in a natural position. The ribs had fallen out, but lay in order on either side of the coffin, and the skull had not moved in the least from its proper place. The teeth of the upper jaw must have been shaken out by the lifting of the coffin, for they lay scattered about the skull. But those of the lower jaw, which had fallen from the rest of the face, were perfect, not one being missing from either side. The teeth looked pearly white and were in excellent preservation. Without loss of time, Mr. Spence had the coffin placed within a wooden box and lowered to the grave prepared for it. And before the darkness set in, the clay was dashed for the second time with a hollow-sounding casket, and the remains of the poet were covered up. Never, it is hoped, to be disturbed again. Now, each of these accounts reported almost the same details, right down to the perfect teeth, indicating that Mr. Poe apparently practiced good dental hygiene. Now, after Poe was moved to the new spot, he was soon moved again to his permanent location under his big monument where he rests today. Now, one thing missed out of those articles is that the witnesses picked up pieces of the coffin to take home as souvenirs. Now, some were made into pins and pin holders. In fact, one of these pins eventually was passed on to the novelist George Hazelton. Hazelton was at work in 1909 on a novel to be called The Raven, a love story of Edgar Allan Poe. So he was given this, but he said there was a problem. According to an April 10th, 1909 article in the Cincinnati Inquirer, he said, I began with merely writing the number of the chapter at which I was at work at the head of the blank page of the manuscript. One night I was using the pen when suddenly I noticed the word Aronel. E-R-O-N-E-L written through chapter one. I looked again and put it down to the mischievous writing of a child or servant. I took a fresh sheet of paper and started to write chapter at the head of it. When almost before my eyes, the pen on its own accord wrote the same mysterious word, Aronel. Apparently this infuriated him so much that he struggled to write the word chapter and found that what appeared to be red ink splattered onto his shirt. This was all the more mysterious because he'd been writing with black ink. And then just as suddenly as the red ink appeared, it disappeared. I think about that time he decided maybe he should get a different pen. But he saved those pages with that word Aronel written at the top. Eventually he showed it to some friends they had no idea what this word meant. 
until one of them thought to hold it up to a mirror and saw that it's the word Lenore written backwards. Now, of course, this story is probably a fabrication intended to sell copies of his novel. The novel The Raven became popular enough that eventually it was adapted into a 1915 film, which you can still view online today. The other pieces of the coffin were scattered throughout the country with one finding its way to a private collection in New York City. Thanks to the generosity of this private collector, this fragment of Poe's coffin is on loan to the Edgar Allan Poe Museum for the rest of the year. So as soon as we reopen, you can come see this little piece of history in person. Well, thanks for joining me for this evening's Curator's Crypt. I look forward to seeing you again next time to tell you more about my favorite Poe artifacts from the collection. Thanks for joining us today, and don't forget to support the Poe Museum at poemuseum.org slash support, or visit our online store at poemuseum.org slash museum store.